Hello everyone, today I'll be presenting my work on a redundancy system, specifically the Allen Bradley Control Logics redundancy system I've been working on here at my internship at ACE. The initial question is what is a redundancy system? In our case, our redundancy system consists of two PLCs. The idea with our redundancy system is we have a main primary PLC. Now this PLC will be controlling our process, performing all the control actions necessary for the system, whilst the secondary or synchronised PLC is a standby PLC, ready to assume control in the event of a major fault, power loss, communication loss through the primary PLC. So how that's implemented in terms of control logics and Allen Bradley PLCs is we have a specific module installed in both PLC racks. This is called a redundancy module. Now the one specifically we've been working on, there exists multiples, is the 756 RM2 module. And that exists on both chassis as labelled. This module controls all of the cross-loading events between the PLC. That is an event which controls the distribution of the program position from the primary PLC alongside the data values at any given stage of the program to the secondary PLC. The way that's implemented for Allen Bradley PLCs is through two optic fibre channels connected between our redundancy modules, channel 1 and channel 2, are labelled as such. So channel one and channel two aren't both used. We have an active connection, which can be either channel two to channel two or channel one to channel one. That active connection performs the cross-loading I was talking about, so it allows that synchronization of program state. Whilst the other channel is the redundant channel, in the same way the redundant PLCs work, where if a major fault occurs on the PLC, the redundant cable takes over and performs that cross-loading operation. So the main consideration with dealing with these redundant setups, specifically with Alan Bradley, is that the redundancy system cannot control the remote I.O. directly. That is, I.O. modules cannot be present in both chassis, and they have to be externally connected through communication modules. So the communications modules that we've been working with have been Ethernet modules. We have two modules per chassis. And the reason we have that two modules per chassis is because the modules in each chassis must match exactly. So in each slot, moving left to right, slot one, two, three, four, all of the modules in each slot have got to match. So the idea is that if the primary system, the primary controller is performing an action, the secondary controller can immediately perform that action without any difference in the program or hardware configuration. So in our module, we have Ethernet modules, which is 756EN2TR. The two is important in our redundancy system because only enhanced Ethernet communication modules can be used in this redundancy setup. That's an important consideration to make in terms of the hardware alongside that the modules must match. So these Ethernet modules, in our case, are connected to our remote I.O. rack, which allows us to control the system externally to this setup. And the control is performed through our controller modules, which L84Es on both PLCs, as I mentioned, both slots must match. So these PLCs perform the control operations for the system, including the remote I.O. Other important considerations when you have this system is the firmware. So the firmware for this system is provided by Alan Bradley, and it's, it's really important that it's actually got a match for the controller that's being used. So for example, the L84E that we have has its own uh, package of 5580 family controllers, and that provides the firmware for all of the possible different communications modules you may use, also the different revisions of the redundancy modules. The reason why you have two communication modules is just to match it for us. So obviously you need a communication module in the same slot for both chassis, but you don't necessarily need two. I believe the reason we chose two is due to yeah, the speed of the ports, because these communication modules were 100 megabit per second, right? And the gigabit port on the controller, we noted earlier that that was not able to be used in a redundancy system. So that was the loss of the redundancy. That's with all Allen Bradley redundancy systems. It's not just you know the setup that we've got specifically. As soon as you enable redundancy, in Allen Bradley through Studio 5000, that, that port is lost, you can no longer communicate with it completely. So, you know, regardless, we would have needed a communication module, but even if we didn't have remote I.O. because of our programming as well as a consideration. The key is that the communication modules in the same slot have been able to communicate over that network. So the idea would be, let's say, if you wire both modules into a switch, then both modules can communicate through another Ethernet module on a remote I.O. rack, also route it through that switch and maintain connection through the switchover. So you can't have the same slot Ethernet module 
communicated to, to different points because otherwise it can't communicate with the same device, which in this case is our remote IO rack. That was actually the uh, bottleneck we were having for a while because we didn't realise that all of the Ethernet modules ports had to be used. And the reason for that is because when the, when the, the system takes over, it's expecting all of the hardware to be identical. And obviously, if you've got nothing plugged in at all, it can't, really can't simulate and replicate nothing. So that would be in its qualification process when it actually determines if the system's valid to actually form a synchronised pair. So that's the initial process it's got to go through. And as it's running, it checks that qualification. So that synchronised state can exit at any given point to a disqualified state as soon as a detection is, is made that it's no longer compatible. So if I was to detract um, an Ethernet cable outside of a port, it would lose its ability to replicate that system, even though the primary's control would be like still able to communicate to the switch just fine. As a result of this, you know, losing its ability to replicate that, it would become disqualified. It's not necessarily that they've got to be able to communicate together, it's that they've got to be able to communicate to the same field device. And with the cables, let's say if I was to unplug a cable, as both PLCs lose that connection, it won't perform a switchover event. The only switchover event that will occur is if I was to unplug the active cable, which is currently loading the system, it would switch over to the redundant cable, and that would perform the same kind of switchover of control. But yeah, you wouldn't actually lose a synchronized state because the system can still perform its cross-loading operations properly. So it's not the same as if you were to remove a communication through an external connection, which, is, which was an interesting distinction that we were able to make. So the scenario that we were testing mainly was if there was a communication loss. Let's say I was to unplug an Ethernet cable from the communication module uh, just directly. A switchover event would occur where the secondary, the synchronised secondary, would become the primary. Or we could just switch off the PLC's power power lost, but more generally it's just a major fault in the system. So if the, the main controller is no longer able to perform all the control operations that it was configured for, it will detect that and the remote uh, redundancy module will perform that switch over through the connection of the fibre optic channels. That's not performed through the, through the Ethernet, that's all performed through the uh, fibre optic channels here. Which is what makes the system so like modular and able to be introduced into like multiple different setups is all you need is the redundancy module to be present and the hardware configuration to be correct. There is no difference in the program which runs on the primary and the secondary. One's just standing by and ready to assume direct control. Very little program configuration. It's all done through the actual separate tool used for these modules called uh, the Redundancy Module Configuration Tool, which is the RMC team. You can open that from Studio 5000 and you know, have it work in there, but it's not part of the program, it's completely separate. So I can edit that while the program is running, for example. And that handles things like you can set the mode of configuration such that it will synchronise automatically and always as soon as uh, the connection is made. So if this is in a disqualified state, which is the general state, before it's able to uh, synchronise through checking the hardware setups and the firmware and configuration settings. That's, that's able to set it to automatically synchronise. So that's what you want if it's in a remote site and something become disconnected. You want an operator to be able to go in, fix the issue and have it automatically synchronise, which is what that setting would be used for. You've also got a setting called Never for auto synchronisation and you can manually synchronise the modules through that RMCT tool and that's um, something you can perform testing for, for as well. So you're able to initiate a switch over, you're able to qualify automatically and disqualify. That's what that tool is used for. In that tool, there's multiple different options as well. You can determine, we can set a description for each chassis in terms of its ID. So you can label, let's say the primary as chassis A and this is chassis B. And the reason you might want to do that is if you're trying to report off to you know, external devices or a SCADA to describe which chassis is in control of the system, then you can uh, extract that chassis ID through the system value and you can use that. Uh, you can configure also whether the program can actually control the PLCs. Now there is limited control for the program as all of it's done through the RMCT, but through a program you can initiate a switchover, for example. That's, a, that's an important distinction to make. There's a lot of read values that you can do and system values you can get but there's not much you can actually do through the program to affect the system. It's mostly just set up, uh, let it run, and then it will automatically handle the redundancy switchover when it needs to. The troubles configuring this and, and, and issues that you'd encounter are not to do with like the program and how, you'd, and, and how you'd write that. It's all to do with the initial configuration, and it can be quite difficult to determine why a certain fault is actually occurring. 
in um, the event log in the RMCT tool that I was speaking of is a good way of determining that. The issue with that is when it reports an event, you know, when it's trying to qualify, there may be 20 events leading up to that point. You may get a communication error that pop up as an event and then immediately after that a firmware fault as a result. However, it's hard to distinguish which fault is actually causing that. So the proper way to set up these systems is to make sure all of the hardware and configuration is set up before, and so that you can isolate individual problems without relying too heavily on the event logger in that RMCT tool. It's also got other important features in the tool. For example, it will tell you which module was causing the issue to prevent a qualification in the first place. And that's important as, for example, one ethernet module could be an issue versus the rest, as one could have a different mask and that would prevent it, which is one of the issues that we were having at the beginning. All the IP addresses were configured correctly, but as a mask was different, it was able to ruin the process. And that's not something that was reported directly on the display of the module. It will report the IP and not the mask. It will just be a black box in that sense, unless you're able to, to use the tool and set it up correctly in the first place. So if you actually dis uh, unplug one of the fibre optic cables, it's not an issue and you won't lose synchronisation because as I said, the other cable will become the active. It will perform its own little switchover mechanism for the cables without doing it for the PLCs. But if you were to remove both cables, the switchover would not occur because it was able to identify that the cable was the fault and not the PLC in the first place. No switchover event would occur. However, the secondary PLC that was synchronised and able to crossload would no longer be able to do that and it would become disqualified. Nothing necessarily poor would happen to the system, but it would lose its ability to, to crossload. In software, there is no way to designate specifically which channel and thus which cable is actually the active, which is continuously crossloading and which is a standby as a redundant. And that's entirely based on when you plug in the order. So if I plugged in channel one to channel one first, it would become the active and then channel two to channel two would become the redundant. And there's no way to, after I've done that, remotely switch over which channel is, is causing that. So it would automatically do that if there was a fault in the cable, which is why that redundant setup is set up there. But there is no way to do that through software. What you can do is you can initiate a switch over the PLCs through the RMCT and you can disqualify or qualify the secondary, but you can't select individually which channel is used to actively crossload the data. Unless there is an issue specifically with a transceiver of the channel, that wouldn't really be something you'd have to worry about because obviously if there's a fault in the cable it would automatically handle that switch over. So it would never be a situation where it's unable to crossload and it doesn't report or fix itself. So it's not really going to be an issue in that sense. As for the program considerations, I noted that there is not much configuration you have to do in the program itself to get this to work once you've set it up properly and have actually got it to synchronize in the first place. Um, the issue arises specifically with the cross-loading uh, in terms of the program because obviously that's what's uh, synchronizing the program position and the data between the PLCs. If the way you write your program is multiple disjointed variables many periodic tasks or continuous tasks firing very frequently. What you can do is, is, is extend this cross-loading time very substantially. Obviously, that's going to slow, slow the switch over. And if you don't design your task correctly in, in terms of, of, of priority and programs, what can happen is lower priority program could be exited upon switch over and restarted at the beginning of the higher priority task. If you've got multiple tasks in a different priority, cross-loading will only occur after all of those tasks have been executed at the end of the program. And if it takes too long to do that and you're gonna be jumping between tasks, the lower priority task could be exited before the total program has been able to be executed. And as a result, you could be rerunning that multiple times um, if it is scan dependent, which is something to keep in mind. With that as well, the organisation of the data into memory is also very important. Because if you don't organise things into UDTs, which are basically user-defined structs, and you don't organise bits into arrays, for an example, what you'll end up with is a bit in memory stored as, as four bytes because obviously there's a lot of overhead that Studio 5000 introduces in terms of fault finding and alarms set for bits. If that bit isn't existing in an array which has its own alarm system and fault finding, you'll end up spending four bytes 
just to allocate uh, a bit in the program and as a result you're 32 times in the amount of data you're actually cross-loading and that can get even worse if you assign that bit in the wrong place in your program so instead of a UDT you assign it as an individual boolean um, based on the way that it organizes its memory into into sets of 4096 bytes or they call them pages if you set a bit in that page and then change its value it'll be cross-loaded but it won't just crossload the bit, it'll actually crossload the whole 4096 bytes. So there's a massive inefficiency that can occur there if you set it in the wrong place in memory. So the program is important, but it's not important to your initial configuration and synchronization. And you can think of when that is actually going to be an issue is when you're approaching a switchover event. If it's taking a long time to crossload and all of a sudden in the middle of that you have a switchover event, then you've only got a small portion of your data most recently crossloaded. So that can be a big issue for systems where um, timing is important and an issue for systems where a scan order of, of the tasks matters quite substantially. For example, you could be closing and opening a relay if you have the same program run twice as a result of a, of a switchover occurring and running that same task twice, which would be a massive issue if you're dealing with a safety system um, where that relay is supposed to provide protection. No, power supply redundancy is like a separate system. There is a separate manual on that. This is just dealing with the redundancy of the controllers themselves. So a switchover event only deals with that. However, um, I believe in the project that we're working with, there exists multiple power supplies that are, that are supplying both PLCs and both racks separately regardless. So if we were to introduce the redundant power supplies, you'd have two power supplies per PLC. Uh, which would just multiply quite high, you know, four total power supplies rather than the two which already exist and are in and of themselves redundant in that way. That's completely separate to this setup. But you can think of what would happen if a power supply was to fail. Well, if a power supply was to fail on the primary, a switchover event would occur to the secondary. Versus if you did have two power supplies and one was redundant, you would retain that primary state as the other one would have taken over. But either way, an operator would have to go out or a maintenance um, person would have to go out and replace that redundant power supply as in the same way that they would have to come and fix the power supply for the primary that was lost. So you're not gaining anything out of having that redundant power supply necessarily in this situation. As we're using remote I.O., there is two ways of setting up the IP addressing on these Ethernet modules. One is that you have them completely separate and that's fine as long as you're keeping what you're communicating with in a you know, section down. Um, but since we're using remote I.O. we have to use a technique called IP swapping. Now IP swapping entails assigning the same IP address to both modules in the same slot on both PLCs and during operation when they synchronize the IP address of the secondary will be incremented by one and that will allow the, the network to be able to handle the two different IP addresses while the, the PLCs are running. However in a switchover event uh, the IP addresses will swap so there will actually be no loss in connection uh, between the Ethernet modules on the remote I.O. and on the rack in the event of that switchover as they're communicating to the same IP address. There's no overhead with that as the redundancy module handles that upon switchover. So that's the same for both, in our case, both Ethernet modules. So if this was set to some IP address ending in a 1, the secondary would increment it to a 2 when it's operating, and upon the switchover occurring, the IP address on the secondary with the 2 would become the secondary IP address over there. So there's no switching of IP addresses between the primary and secondary. They're carried over um, in that switching event. There will never be an IP address conflict if you're using it in that way as it's the only way you can actually have them communicate reliably to remote I.O. and remain and retain that connection upon a switchover. That's a consideration to make with you using remote I.O. specifically. You don't need it for, uh, for using HMIs, um, for example, if that's the only thing you're communicating with. In the event log, everything is timestamped. So you'd be able to see when the switchover event occurred and then when the new primary was to take over control. So that's something that you can see in the event log of how long that would take. But you can, in the manual, it provides you know, substantial documentation of how long that switchover event takes. With Ethernet modules, that communication can be lost momentarily. And that's something there's no configuration to solve that issue. Because this is happening very fast. That, that loss of communication would be no longer than uh, 20 milliseconds. This happens, that switchover you know, time is around 20 milliseconds. And cross-loading can, can occur extremely fast. These uh, communication modules 
communicate at 1,000 megabytes per second. So, and that's the minimum time it takes to switch over. So that's something that's limited to the, to the hardware. That's something that's already pre-existing pre in the firmware in the same way that the switch over occurs automatically. And you don't have to manually synchronize it every single time if that's not something you configure. Obviously, if you were, let's say, tracking an analog value and then a switchover event occurred, you may have a loss of, of data for that window in which the switchover was happening, but there would be no loss in program position, for example. So you'd still be able to do the processing, but the, the data that you'd be processing would have that 20 millisecond or so gap. It will retain the last value, and when, it, when communication is then re-established upon that switchover, it will update yeah. to the new value. That's right. Yeah, the program position, for example, won't change. But let's say if you did have a program which had three programs, <coughs> the program with the highest priority may be running, and then a switchover event would occur. The crossload is only valid up to the start of that program, so you will be restarting that program if it was to happen. So crossloading occurs at the end of every program, and you can customize that you know, slightly. You can customize that to happen at the, um, like the end of every task, but that's actually a longer window between crossloads because you have multiple programs per task. So the shortest window is, is at the end of every program. So there's no way to crossload as you're scanning through a rungs in a program which is an important thing to note, um, which is why I was saying it's not a good idea to use scan-dependent programs as you'd be potentially running them multiple times. Scan-dependent may be, for example, every time you run a scan through that routine, it may flip a bit one to zero. Let's just say if that was flipping the bit of a relay, if you'd run that scan cycle twice, it would flip it to zero, to uh, say activate it if it was uh, act active low and then it would scan again and then flip it back to high and that would open the relay again. So that would be a you know, major safety fault if that was to occur. So that's a consideration you have to make.